Good morning, Falcon of Faith, family and friends, and first-time visitors in person and online. Welcome to Falcon of Faith Baptist Church, and we pray that during our worship service, you will be spiritually inspired. Today is our special back-to-school prayer service. Thank you for your presence, and we look forward to you visiting us again. We are located at 14513 South Coast Road, Road, Houston, Texas, 77045, on the campus of Holy Trinity Missionary Baptist Church. Please visit our website, www.folbchouston.org. You may also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. The following are Fountain of Faith Baptist Church announcements. FOFBC Sunday services and times in person are as follows. Sunday school, 9.30 a.m. Sunday morning service, 11 o'clock a.m. Wednesdays, 7 o'clock p.m. prayer meeting and Bible study. And most scheduled meetings are via Zoom. Brotherhood meeting is Thursday, August 17th at 7 o'clock p.m. Deacon's meeting will be held Thursday, August 24th at 7 o'clock p.m. Our next marriage ministry is scheduled for Saturday, September 9th, 7 o'clock p.m. Again, most meetings are busy. The August FOFBC Women of Faith outing will be announced this week. Please continue to fast and pray for FOFBC as we relocate. Congregational prayer, and prayer is collectively done on Tuesdays, 6 o'clock a.m. to 7 o'clock a.m. and or 6 o'clock p.m. to 7 o'clock p.m. As you know, it's time for our students to return back to school. Therefore, your monthly FOFBC scholarship donations are greatly appreciated. Next month, our scholarship recipients will be announced. Remember, dollars for our scholars. All September announcements are asked to be turned in to the Secretary of Staff by August 30th, 2023. The FOFBC secretarial schedule hours are Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Sundays, 9 a.m. to 1 o'clock. FOFBC members are encouraged to visit your weekly e-blast emails. Our announcements, prayer and schedule, church activities are available online. And again, each member receives that e-blast. Today's spiritual thought, when we put our problems in God's hands, He puts His peace in our hearts. Our message today, focus on things above. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. And now, I present our diligent and faithful senior pastor, teacher, Reverend Mark A. Thank you. But I want you to be mindful how you can receive what God has in store for you. You have to be willing to link the written word uh, with the living word so God can give you a personal word always come to church looking to receive what God has in store for you. Even though you hear a general word, God also, he has a personal word that is inside of that. Sort of like when Jesus taught the parables. Everybody would hear a general word, understand the basic story, but not 
everyone would understand the spiritual principles that were linked to that. And so we have for your consideration today, and my topic is, repeat after me, focus on, focus on things, above. things above. Focus on things above. In other words, be sure that you have a divine perspective as opposed to a human perspective. Uh, be, be caught up in what Christ says and not what the culture says. Uh, because there's so much information that is passed on to us in the age in which we live. We live in the information age. We live when uh, we're getting messages nonstop in various modes and ways. But the Apostle Paul, uh, even during the time of the early church, had a word for us today. Uh, as he wrote to Colossians, he said, you need to focus on things that are above. Uh, because the things beneath here on this earth, you have to remember who is the small G, who is the small God of this world, who is Satan. And he has blinded the minds of those who reject God's truth. He has blinded the minds of those who have reject God's truth. So what's the big deal about that? Because they are the ones who create, quote unquote, the culture. They are the ones who create the culture. They are the ones that say, this is how you make it. This is how you should live on earth. Not knowing they have been deceived by Satan. So in our passage today, that's in the book of Colossians there, it's important that you go there and understand that, that the whole backdrop of this particular book was a time when Paul was writing to Colossians and telling them to beware of the false teaching in the land. Uh, you'll find that in uh, chapter 2, verse 4. He said, beware of those teaching uh, false doctrines with enticing words. Uh, he, that, those, those false doctrines had infiltrated the church at Colossae and apparently causing some people to add unnecessary and unhelpful elements to their Christian faith. Be careful by adding to God's word. God said, don't add to nor take away. And so Paul sent this letter to remind the Christians uh, of the superiority of Jesus over Jewish rules and regulations. Isn't it something I, know, I wonder if you've noticed over the years, you know, after you were saved, Somewhere down the line, you're saved by grace, and then people start becoming legalistic. Uh, you know, they start talking about rules when they talk about God's grace. So God is more interested in the spirit of the law than the letter of the law. And so this is what Paul is emphasizing here. Be careful, because you know what? A dog looks just like a wolf. A dog looks just like a wolf. So we have to develop the spirit of discernment. And Jesus is telling them that... Uh, Anything that is contrary to his word is not his will. So, uh, in Colossians, third chapter, verse 1 through 4, uh, that passage, the Apostle Paul, who is the author, reminds the Colossian believers that they have been risen with Christ. And this means they have died to the old life, you know, the life prior to salvation, and have been raised to a brand new life at the point of salvation. And we're going to find out what this is all about. So now they ought to make this new life that they have in Christ the focus of their intention. The focus of their intention. Uh, this is uh, the path to holiness, the path to sanctification, and being set apart to Christ. The word sanctification, the word holiness, means to be set apart. It doesn't mean that you are without sin or without error. So God knows that we're not perfect, but he expects us to be faithful. God knows that we're not perfect, but he expects us to be faithful. And so here we see they are no longer to live the old life they used to live, but acknowledge they possess the eternal life of Christ and have been raised to live a life on another planet. To live a life on another planet. And so, so what am I saying here? Uh, God is saying uh, you, 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 have, you have two citizenships here. You are citizens of earth and you are citizens of heaven as well. And because now you live in a whole brand new dimension, I expect you to live on this new level. Uh, they must not be ignorant nor forgetful of who they are and how they are to live. And finally, all sinful passion is controlled and conquered by the power of the indwelling Christ by means of our union with Him. You know, God has given us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to form as a temple for the indwelling Christ. You probably didn't think about it much, but the Christ indwells you. He indwells you when you're in fellowship. So it's important to understand that. He, he tells them, Paul does, that their minds need to be focused on things above. Their mind needs to be focused on things above. For your consideration, I'll read for the context of our verse today. 
about uh, these things we need to be focused on. Some things need to be retained, some things need to be released, and of course, some things need to be remembered. Uh, Colossians 3 and 1 says, Therefore, Paul says, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, let your mind, set your mind rather, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And finally, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. May God have a blessing to the hearers and doers of his holy word. And you'll see on your handout here uh, some of the things that can cause us to be distracted from the truth. Uh, sometimes, uh, I don't know how men think that they're smarter than the Lord. So I picked up a few principles here from one of my favorite theologians, uh, Dr. Charles Stanley, and he commented in his uh, sermon notes on privilege, the privilege corrupted. What is this privilege that has been corrupted? The privilege to get to know God. Sometimes we, we don't take advantage of the privilege, amen, if you see, the privilege to get to know God. We pass that up. And, and why would a thing like that happen? Well, he talks about it, it happens in four stages progressively, really, to break it all down to the elementary of it all. Uh, four stages progressively take a person or a nation downhill from the knowledge of God to complete depravity. You see, that's the cycle that goes on and on for every nation. They cry out to the Lord, he hears that cry, he blesses them, they thank him, they stray from him, they serve out of God's, they become depraved, they distance themselves, they get punished by the Lord, they're sent back in slavery, they cry out again. That's also a true uh, cycle of, of personal lives as well. Well, look at the first point. Some people are just too intelligent for the Lord. They, they think they know it all. Everyone begins with a partial knowledge of God. You know, because when you look out, you know there has to be a divine designer somewhere. You see the moon, the stars, you see his creation. So everyone begins with a partial knowledge of God. And also, Ecclesiastes says he had placed eternity in the hearts of men. He placed eternity in your subconscious, knowing that that's something missing. So we all begin with a partial knowledge of God throughout our conscience and uh, the witness of creation. And although people have the capacity to understand that he exists, they often close their eyes to the truth so that they can avoid changing their behavior. Changing their behavior. See, change is very difficult. Most people don't like to change, especially if they're comfortable in the sin that they're in. And so God is saying, that's, that's one reason that they're, they're just too intelligent for their own good. They want to do things their way. And then there's some people who choose to remain ignorant of God's word. But when people begin to suppress the truth, it talks about that in Romans, by the way, they suppress the truth in their minds. Uh, they dishonor God, and he gives them over to the darkness of their heart. They say, you know, people say all the time, well, I don't go to church that much, but Lord knows my heart. Yeah, he knows your heart is dark. He knows it's very dark in there, and you don't want any of his light. And so the Apostle John puts it this way. People love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. They didn't want to be exposed. You don't like when you got roaches, and you turn on the light, and it's scattered everywhere. They don't want that light. They want to continue to rummage in that trash. They will continue to rummage in that thing that's not good for them. Then some people say, no, I just like the sin that I'm in. So sometimes indulgence will keep them from getting to know God as they should. They reject uh, the wisdom from above and they want the wisdom from beneath. Indulgence, searching for something to fill a void caused by refusing to acknowledge God. People freely, and God gives you that freedom. He allows us sovereignty to coexist with your free will. That's how good God is. Sort of like the prodigal son we were studying about this morning. He said, okay, I'm your father, you want your wealth, you want, you want to go on your own? Okay, son, you go right ahead. You go right ahead, because I already know the bottom is going to fall out, and you're going to come back. You go right ahead. And that's what God does for us. So you want to reject the truth and indulge in sin, because you're searching for something to fill a void that only I can. So when we willfully choose to worship idols, God made it so simple. He said, I even let you in America have a show called, uh, what do you call idol, American Idol. <laughs> he said, I'm gonna make it plain for some of y'all. Because uh, you really are worshiping something beyond me. Only thing beyond God is a demon. The only thing beyond God is a demon. So uh, he says now, uh, whether that's popularity or money or some other poor choice that we make, 
God will give us over to the lust of our hearts. That's, that's God's passive wrath, you know, when he allows us to, you know, to suffer from our own bad decisions. And then there are people that are just so, uh, they're just so resistant, they're, they're, they're just so rebellious, they have an impenitent heart. They refuse to repent. Uh, they become callous. Their calluses begin to form on their souls. And, and God's word can't get through. So like the Pharaoh of old, he gave them ten times, ten opportunities. Let my people go. Receive my word. Let my people go. Well, eventually as people, we move further away from God. And he gives them over to a depraved mind, it said here. A depraved mind. As yes, you can see how our society has become upside down. We are, we're not trying to live right side up in a society that's upside down. And these people are so immoral that they not only deny God's laws for themselves, but they also heartily approve of others who openly rebel against God's law. Are we not living in that day right now? Are we not living in that day right now? But thank God for his grace and his mercy. He said in 2 Peter 3, 9, he says, I'm not willing for any to perish, but that all men might come to repentance. So don't think I'm slow about keeping my promise, about sending those who reject me to hell. I'm just holding out for them. And so uh, we need to thank God no matter how far down the path of spiritual darkness someone is, there is always the hope of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ while you're alive, while you're alive. There's no way station after you die. Nobody can pray you out of hell into eternity. You have an opportunity to make your decision while you draw breath and you're in your right mind. So when we turn to God, uh, we can be assured he will accept us into his spiritual family and give us the assurance of eternal life. That's why we need to focus on things above. Let's look at some of the things God says. There's some things I want you to retain now as you get ready to renew your mind, as you get ready to make this transformation, as you get ready to move from being a caterpillar and becoming a butterfly. He says, now Paul says, talk about putting on a new self. He says, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, you know, a lot of children are raised in, in church, but they're not raised in Christ. Yeah. It's one thing to be raised in church, but not raised in Christ. You see, if you're raised in Christ, those children uh, have an opportunity uh, to come to Sunday school and learn more about the Lord, and very seldom will they have to be have to show up for court. It's better to show up for Sunday school than to show up for court. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Amen. I, I, I would say that too. And so God is saying now, uh, uh, therefore, if you've been raised up in Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father. Jesus Christ is still at work for us at the right hand of the Father. He's our advocate. Uh, he's, uh, 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 he's handling our case when, when Satan brings something against us. So Paul is telling us that there are a couple of precious spiritual possessions we would be willing to hang on to. Now in the process of renewing our mind, changing our mind, there's some things God says, I want you to hold on to. I want you to hold on to the awareness of our foundation. Because it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 11, no foundation can any man lay other than that which is Christ Jesus. Don't forget your roots in God's word. And secondly, uh, he says, I want you to keep your attention and focus on Christ. That's where it's rule number three. Acknowledge your circumstances, but keep your eyes on the Lord. And you're going to always have circumstances. They're not going anywhere as long as we live on the earth. But let's go back to the foundation. Verse three, first part of verse three, it says, Now Paul tells us we are risen in Christ. He said, now, therefore, if, I'm not here, by the way, some are and some not. If you have been risen in Christ, uh, this is not a statement of possibility. It's a declaration of a spiritual reality if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. And I say, I want you to think about it. Now, you're a child of the king. Now, you're a citizen of a kingdom without limitations, a child of a king with no limitations. Uh, so uh, a citizen of a kingdom that could not be shaken, a child of a, of a king without limitations. Remember your identity. Satan wants you to change your identity. He says, no, don't forget you're a child of God. And so right here, if you have been risen in Christ, and this metaphor is used to let us know how our identity is in Christ, when he, baptism talks about when he goes down in the water, he's going down in the grave, when he comes up, he's rising out of the grave. He, he lives. Uh, we have hope because he lives. So Paul says, now, if you have been risen in Christ, and you are, he says, since you are risen, what Paul is really saying here, he's discussing our spiritual position. Sometimes we forget our position in the Lord. 
you know, uh, there are three areas that we, 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 we God is telling now, once you become, you come to the faith, you, you're operating in three areas. Number one, it's called positional, uh, positional sanctification. I'm setting you apart. You're saved for all eternity. You can't lose your salvation. John 10, 28 says, those of my father that have given me, no one can pluck them out of my hand. But now you're still on earth. He didn't shoot you up like Star Trek, you know, being the up sky. No, you're still here. And so how are we going to live while we're still here? He said, let us grow in the grace and knowledge by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now it's time to grow up. Matter of fact, that's what our uh, theme verse talks about in Ephesians 4 and 15. He said, ministering grace by speaking truth in love as we grow up in Christ Jesus. That's, that's Ephesians 4 and 15. And so, so that, that's experiential sanctification. In other words, we talked about this on Wednesday night Bible Center. We want to walk in the light, not in darkness. In other words, spend more time in fellowship than you do out. God knows that we're not perfect, but he expects us to be faithful. And he expects us to be honest with him. When you know you're out of fellowship, don't wait till it's time to go to bed at night, try to remember all the sins you committed. As they are committed, you are to confess them. Spend more time in fellowship than you don't. Because God says, I've only given you two things to live on this earth. I've given you limited time and a standard to live by. Limited time and a standard to live by. So make sure you spend more time in fellowship than you do out. He said, don't come to me to heaven, you can live to be 90 years old, and you've only been in fellowship for one day. For one day. Because only what you do for Christ will last. And he said, you think, I, I'm going to give you a crown? If you don't get that mop in that bucket, and go scrub Mercury or one of these other planets till I tell you it's time to come in and have lunch. That's what I want you to do. And God says, you don't even have a crown to throw at my feet. So God is saying, make sure you spend more time in fellowship than you do out. Know your spiritual position. So there's a positional sanctification, experiential sanctification. Then when God calls us home, there's ultimate sanctification where we're set apart, where we get to live with him forever in righteousness and in service. That's what God is saying. Know your position in Christ. So when Jesus died on Calvary, every person who would ever place their faith in him also died on that day. That's what he said. No longer me, but in Christ. In Galatians 3.20, that's what it talks about here. In a spiritual sense, we died to the penalty and the power of sin when Jesus died on the cross. And many believers are not aware of that because they haven't grown in God's word. Not saying you won't ever sin again. Number one, we don't have to worry about going to hell. The penalty is taken, take, take, taken away. And now God says, now you're still living. How are you going to deal with the power? You have the power to overcome uh, the flesh of the old sin nature. You have the power to overcome that by spending more time in fellowship than you do out. Don't say, well, I'm only human. So, yeah, I said, I'm only human. So, I, if not, then I, you know, I walk in the flesh more now than then. But God said, why don't you say I'm a Christian? And I walk by the Spirit. That's what God said. I want you to start thinking. You have to change your mindset. No, you say, I'm a Christian. And therefore, I walk in the Spirit. Is what God is telling us here. So we are without excuse. Uh, because we are dead. You are dead. We don't have to worry about being punished for our sins. We need to thank God for that. Because the price was paid. And Romans 6.23 says, and, and, and Adam all died. And Christ all are made alive again. We have the same. Do you know Jesus Christ, when he walked this earth, he only operated off of two things. I'm trying to break it down and keep it as simple as possible. You see, he operated off the filling of the Holy Spirit and God's word in the stream of his consciousness. We talk about how we can think on things above. Jesus Christ only operated off of two things in his humanity. Filling of the Holy Spirit and God's word in the stream of his consciousness 24-7. So God says, imitate me. You see, uh, if he's going to be our example, let's imitate the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God is saying now, uh, because I died, God said, through his son Jesus Christ, I've also been liberated from the power of sin in my life. Every child of God, you need to see yourself as being dead to sin. It does not have to rule you. That's what God is saying here. Matter of fact, over in 2.20, he says, you have your Bible right there if you have one, whether it be paper or on your phone. In, 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 in Colossians 2.20, it says this, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourselves to decrees, and it goes on to talk about some of the other things we're going to mention later. Why do you submit yourself 
to, to the elementary principles of the world if you died in Christ and now you have the power of the Spirit working in you. So he poses a very good question. We must never forget that we're dead to sin and alive to a brand new life in Christ. So we have to be aware of our foundation in Jesus Christ and quit going along with the culture. You see, the only thing that just goes along with everything else is dead fish. Dead fish. And God says, I want you to show that you're alive. Now, this knowledge will help us to live a, a clean life and a life that's closer to the glory of God. How can a young man keep his way clean in a contaminated world? By keeping short accounts where you are spiritually at all times. So the awareness of your foundation. Then there's also, you need to keep the, your attention focused on the Savior. Keep your attention focused. We're talking about some things you need to retain. Retain your knowledge of your foundation. Retain your focus of the one who can see you through whatever circumstance that you fall into. So, we see here the second part of verse 1 leading into verse 2. He says, keep seeking, keep pursuing the things above. Talking about God's Word. You know, uh, anything that is against God's Word is against God's will. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. Now, we should not only be telling these things to our children and our grandchildren, these are things we should be living out and thinking on a daily basis. Look, we live in a very strange time right now. So if the Christians don't come back to God, we're in big trouble. God will bless this nation by association if we stay in fellowship and remain obedient to his will and his way. And so we, we see here, uh, God is talking about the attention of our focus. How, how, how single-minded are we regarding his word? Since we have been raised to life in Jesus Christ, we're told, seek those things that are above. Underline the word seek. This, this word is, is, is written in the present tense. In other words, we're told to continually be seeking those things which are above. Not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday, but daily. To daily be taken in God's word. We should be uh, having prayer and devotion on a daily basis at home in our personal life. Regardless of how long it lasts. If it only lasts five minutes, so be it. At least you're ready to walk out the door. But if you walk out that door without spending time with the Lord, you are at risk. We talk about at-risk children. We talk about at-risk children in the kingdom. We got a lot of at-risk children in the kingdom. You walking out the door, talking about I go with my first mind, and your first mind is always out of fellowship. You uh, will return home in maybe 30 minutes to an hour with a pink slip in a box and lost your job because you said the wrong thing at the wrong time. Life is about timing. And you need to be in tune and rhythm with the Lord. So it says, seek those things which are above. Then we get to verse 2. It builds on that thought by, by telling us to what? To set our affections or to set our minds, what it really means. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Don't you get caught up in the culture. Christians will always be counterculture. That doesn't mean you argue with people. Just know that you don't go along with the flow. Because now it's so bad. Now it's all about greed and money. You know, before, you know, people didn't want to have to deal with that. Anything to do with this alphabet soup called the LGBTQ. And I'm confused like you are too. Uh, you know, all these different alphabets. Now all of a sudden, you know, if you're not in league with them, you're in trouble. Because it's about money. Now that they've gotten to a point they had so many supporters, I mean, when they first got a lot of billionaires for their cause, so it's over with now. And then when they wrote it into uh, the state laws, uh, it's all about money. And God is saying, now, uh, that doesn't mean that you sacrifice my truth. You ought to be tolerant, but not to the exclusion of the truth. You ought to be tolerant, but not to the exclusion of the truth. And Satan is making inroads in our nation. It, when he starts changing the foundation of what makes up our nation, you know, uh, institutions like uh, uh, marriage and family, are being attacked on a daily basis. Our children are confused. They don't know right from left now. The things that they're seeing on TV, hearing on radio, uh, just looking at it online. If we do not set a solid foundation, uh, the future looks very dim for this nation. And so God says in Psalm 32, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. It all begins with us uh, seeking those things that are above. And so he says, set your affections. Set your mind is what he's saying here. We are told we are to focus our thoughts on heavenly things, not earthly things. We are to set our minds on the things of God 
and on the things that bring glory to him, not to us. If we are always thinking about God getting the glory, we don't have to worry about us getting it. We should be thinking about how I can make, how I can make God famous. You know, not how he can make me famous. How can I make God famous? By living out a life. Live your life out loud. Worship is more than just a 30 minute uh, hour service at, 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 at church. Every day you should be worshiping God by the life that you live. So a quick look at some of these verses following this uh, particular uh, verse here in chapter 2 gives us a little insight into what Paul is talking about. We are to pursue some things, is what Paul is saying here. We're, we're talking about some of the things we need to retain. Let's, let me give you a hint. He says we ought to retain a deeper knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. We are to retain a deeper knowledge of Jesus Christ. It says it right here in the same chapter, uh, verse 10. It says, and have put on the new self of the new man uh, is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Put on that new man. Seek a deeper knowledge of Jesus. And he says also live, live a clean and holy life. He goes on in chapter 3 and in the following verses, 5 through 9, to talk about that. He talks about we are to develop godly virtues. Martin Luther King even said, in order to expel the lower vice, you must concentrate on the higher virtue. There is no higher virtue in God's word. There is no higher virtue. There is such a thing as absolute truth, regardless of what uh, people tell you, instructors tell you. And so you have to have your, your children's mind uh, made up with a solid foundation because when they go out to college, as you know we go, we got all kind of people teaching courses. You know, uh, most of them nowadays are unbelievers. And they're going to challenge your, your children. And if they don't have a solid foundation, they're going to be led astray. Yeah. Number one, they're already really excited about having all this freedom. <laughs> then they're going to start questioning, well, wait, wait, mom and dad weren't right about that. That's the whole point of the part of the son, parent. Oh, so you think I wasn't right about you, wait until I die so you can get this money because they give you an opportunity to grow up and develop some common sense. Yeah. But you want your stuff now, okay, you go right ahead, go right ahead, and I'll watch you fall in that pit. But I'll be here, I'll be waiting. But it's important that, that, that you set in their minds a relationship with Jesus Christ. So that when they do go out, and, and it's, it's incumbent upon everybody, you, you're gonna try things your way, but then when you hit that wall, you go back to what really works. And that's God's word. And so God says, you need to set your mind on these things, and. Develop some virtue in them. Holiness, God says, that, that needs to be holiness in our domestic life. And, and your children need to see that before they go off uh, uh, to, to college. It talks about family relations right there. Uh, we're still in verse, uh, chapter 3, in, in verses 18 all the way through 23. It talks about relationships in the family. Talk about wives, husbands, children, fathers. And when it talks about slaves, it's talking about when you go to work, how you carry yourself. That is certain etiquette we are supposed to have because of the virtue that's in us. See, God did not call us to, to just be good. He calls us to be virtuous. You know, we're talking about the golden rule. No, God doesn't call Christians to live by the golden rule. God calls us to go beyond the golden rule. We ought to live with virtue at all times, that's what God says. So be careful, the mindset that we have and we share with others. And so these are some things that God is saying, I, that's some things I need you to retain. You know, holiness in your social life, in your domestic life, and how to have an effective prayer life. Oh, I used to take prayer for granted too. So I started uh, growing up with God's Word. Lord knows when I became uh, a pastor, I realized how important prayer was. But I will tell you something, teachers. All right. I love my ISS kids. My, my in school suspension kids, they improved my prayer life. Oh, yeah. I really learned to pray then. I said, Lord, I got to be prayed up for a couple of years. Y'all don't, don't think I'm playing. I could see myself on 6 o'clock news handcuff. Yeah. Pastor goes to jail for body slamming students. Oh, Lord, I could just say, Lord, you got to, Lord, you got to help. That's the Red Sea Rules. Thank you, Lord, for the Red Sea Rules. I love you some Red Sea Rules. I learned them Red Sea Rules inside and out before I left Plan Forest High School. Yes, I did. I learned, and I see, I see some of my students today, they're doing very well. They're doing very well. Now this new group, that's why I had to leave when that new group came out. They come in, they, they start moving stuff on my desk, because they were there and they do something to them. 
And our, the, the teachers, they don't have a prayer. <laughs> Every time I see a teacher in trouble, I, I, I say, thank you, Lord. It could have been me. I know it could have been me. Nobody but the good Lord saved me from having a prison number. Anyway, God is good. They will increase your prayer life. You're going to learn how to stay prayed up. That's why God allows adversity in our life. But he also showed me how to be more compassionate toward them as well. God has a reason for everything that he allows. So you have to have an effective prayer life. And when I say effective prayer life, people don't even realize what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that you just pray uh, ritually. That means, is your prayer, is it energized? How can you pray energized prayer? Number one, make sure you have confessed known sins to God. Now, are you praying according to God's will? Those two things, that's all you got to remember. First of all, did I confess my known sins to the Lord? Am, am I keeping one in my back pocket? Number two, now as I pray, am I praying God's word back to him? Am I praying according to God's will? That's an energized prayer. Now the details you can fill in later. So God is saying that through Paul, these are things you need to hold on to. These are things you need to retain. These are things that are going to allow you to become a fruitful witness for the Lord. So in other words, we ought to live like Jesus lived. These are things that he did. This is the way he walked this earth. This is the mindset that he had. We ought to live out the fruit of our values on a daily basis. So nobody should have to wonder if we are saved or not. Now if you've been spending all these years, if your neighbor don't know you're saved, your co-worker don't know you're saved, something's wrong. That, that doesn't mean you go around with a bugle, hey, listen to everybody, I'm a Christian. No, no, they should know something different about you. That's why I quote ad nauseum, first, Peter 3.15, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to give a defense or a reason for the hope that's in you. When you do that, you get the witness by request. In other words, people are going to come up to you. They're going to ask you about your life. They're going to ask you, they eventually trying to ask you, you know, where do you get this peace from? Or why is your countenance always at, 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 at ease and calm? How can I get that? That's witnessing by request. We all should be at a point now where we don't have to go looking for folks to witness to. They come to us. They come to us in some shape, form, or fashion. So this is what God is saying. And this is what we need to be instilling in our children as well. So in this fallen world, God needs for us to show ourselves as genuine Christians. As we give our attention to these spiritual heavenly things, we are enabled to live a heavenly, holy, God-honoring life before this very wicked world that we're in. We are to allow uh, a heavenly perspective to govern our earthly walk. That's what God is saying. These are things I need you to retain. We need to walk as children of the light and not children of the corn. Y'all remember that movie, Children of the Corn? These evil, horrific children, demonic children, you know. God said, walk like children of the light, not children of the corn. And uh, that's what's been produced these last few generations, children of the corn. You know, so, so God is saying, where do we plant? Are you salt and light or are you just sugar and shade? Are you salt and light or have you become sugar and shade? Next outline. Now, now, there's some things you need to release now. That's what we, in our prayer, in our altar prayer, I did, I did a prayer of release also. Some things you got to let go. But you start this new school year with this stuff you had last year. You, you got to let go of some of this stuff, man. Don't you stress yourself out. Uh, don't do it. You know, I know, I know these poor teachers. You tell these young teachers, say, look, I'm thinking about going in teaching. Oh, you baby, are you really thinking about going to teach? Oh, bless your heart. Bless your heart. Look here. Now, that's not something you try. <laughs> that's a calling series. You have to have a spirit of a missionary. You got to be in it for the outcome, not the income. Are you willing to be abused? Okay, all right. Do you love the little children, whatever they do? If they cuss you out like you, are you okay with that? If they threaten to hit you, if the mother comes up here and threatens to shoot you, will you be out? I need you to think about this. And don't just go about what you see on Google. You need to talk to some people that's been doing it for a while. And God will see you through it. And I love the teachers, I love nurses, because these are people that are caregivers. They are interested in the well-being of the people that they serve. And please tell these people, don't be, I tell my students, they say, no, no. First of all, you're scared of blood, okay? You want to be a nurse, that's not for you. Then you say you want to go in and teach. You got an attitude right now. I can see you locked up. <laughs> you need to take another career assessment. <laughs> 
you need to take another career. If it tells you on the career assessment, you must be honest. Yeah. Honest. Don't be trying. You want this job because your mama, your friend had. That's not for you. We are all are tailor made differently. That's what we need to come to grips with. So there are some things we're going to have to release. That's what the second part of this verse is talking about. Uh, let, let your, it says, set your mind on these things above. Then at the bottom it says, not on things that are on the earth. Follow God's way, not, 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 not man's way. There are some things that uh, God is saying here that attach themselves to our lives that, that are just not for us. I don't care what you grew up with, uh, some traditions people share with you, uh, but you need to understand is that go through God's filter. Is, is that what God has called the Christian to do and to be? Those things need to be kicked to the curb if it's not for you. Other things simply don't have a place in our lives, and those things you need to understand and agree with, they need to be let go. Look what Paul is saying in this verse. Paul tells us in verse 2 that, you know, we ought to focus our thoughts on heavenly things. Now, while we do that, he also wants us to understand something. We are to avoid getting caught up in all the things in this world that will swamp our minds. You know, so like the politicians claim they're going to go to Washington and drain the swamp. Yeah. And what they really did is put more alligators in the swamp. So, so God is saying, that's some old, some stinking thinking you got to get rid of. You know, you, I want you to shine. I don't want you to fall in line with what everybody else is doing. You know, what everybody else is doing is for their self-centered uh, motivation. God says, I want you to be motivated by the Savior that made provision for your soul. And so we see here, those are things that will hinder you in your Christian walk. If we allow uh, that mind, uh, the, the old uh, uh, mindset we had before we were saved to govern our new life in Christ, we're asking for faith down the road. But God has given us exactly what we need. So Paul begins to warn them about the false doctrines that they ought to be aware of. False doctrines which are dangerous and they cause distractions to God's plan, purpose, will, and destiny for your life. These are things that would hinder us. So there are certain things we need to let go. And Paul talked about that over in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 8. What, what does Paul say in chapter 2, verse 8? He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. <laughs> Just because it's on TV don't make it right. It doesn't make it right because everybody's promoting it. You know what Book T. Washington said? You know, just because everybody thinks a, a lie and evil is good now, doesn't make it all of a sudden the truth. So, so God is telling us, beware of these false doctrines. The enemy would love nothing, nothing better than for God's people to get themselves uh, trapped in some false system of belief that takes the emphasis off of Christ. We ought to emphasize Christ in everything we think, say, and do. And so he tells us that the enemy does he does these things through what philosophies? And this refers to the wisdom of men. Vain deceit. Uh, this phrase really means empty tricks. Vain deceit. Tradi traditions of men. Believers are warned to be careful of long-held beliefs. Now, we grow up and we're respectful of our parents and our elders. Now, we grow up thinking certain things. As you get older and you find out some of the stuff they told us is not right, you better distance yourself from that. Not distance yourself from them. Distance yourself from that mindset. And if they don't want to hear the truth and you share the truth with them, so be it. You be respectful and you love them from a distance. I did not stutter. You love them from a distance. If people don't want to do right, they will drag you right down the hole that they're in. That's what they'll do. So we're held accountable for the decisions that we make. Your destiny is not a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. Of choice. So traditions of men, these are believers are one to be careful of long-held beliefs. Just because people have believed something to be true. And I've been taught that that something is true does not make it true. What makes it true is what God says about it. If it's against God's word, it's against God's will. That's all we need to know. We're not to base our faith and our walk on the traditions of men, no matter how godly we think they are or how worthy of respect they seem to be. And finally, he says, beware of the rudiments of the world. Again, believers are warned against falling away from a mature faith to accept a simplistic doctrine. Sort of like, you know, I think it's better to practice unholy hibernation. Unholy hibernation. Those of you that are continuing to stay away from the church. Uh, well, ain't nobody else going to church. I can study. I can 
you're just as well at home. At offering time, I can move money out of one pocket to the next. I think I'm covered. No, you're not covered. You're covering yourself right? and put yourself in a hole. And you keep digging, you're going to keep going down, down, down. Down, down, down. Like, you know, like when, when the, the prophet was told Jonah to go to Nineveh, he said he went down. He went down. He didn't go up. He went down. So we are to stay with God's word, which is found in the Bible. B I B L E. Basic instruction before leaving earth. And God says also, beware of foolish demands. Beware of foolish demands and fleshly deeds. All of these are things that need to be released, is what God's telling us here. Uh, Paul warns us, uh, watch out for people who would place them back under the law. You recall what was happening, man, even in Paul's day. You had some people telling them they had to be circumcised in order to be saved. That was a lie. You have some people telling you today that A, B, C, D, and G you have to do before you can be saved. The Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I shall be saved. Acts 16, 31. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So salvation is not a gift uh, for the righteous. Uh, it's a gift for the guilty is what it is. It's not a reward for the righteous. It's a gift for the guilty. Beware of legalism in the, in, in the church age. So Paul is telling him, look at what he says, no man has a right to be their judge. We are to be witnesses, not judges. It's important as we grow out of this and we leave the old way behind, beware of those old fleshly deeds. You know that sin you kept in your pocket in case of emergency, break glass? God says you need to let that go too. You're still confessing that same sin from I don't know how many years ago. God is saying, when are you going to grow up? And so Paul is making it abundantly clear. He lists several common sins of the flesh, and he begins to admonish believers to eliminate those things from their lives. So we got to come clean with God. If we can't come clean with God, then the world is not going to be any better than what it is right now. Things are happening in the world we never saw before. Oh, I don't catch on fire. Well, <laughs> when are y'all going to wake up? You know, I already made a TV show host president. What more, what, what more do you need? What, what more do I need to show you? This is, this is ridiculous, the stuff that's going on in your world. Are oh, you going to turn to me? What are you going to take? Oh, maybe I need to have a donkey to speak to you. Yeah, maybe I need to have a... Now, I made a donkey speak to a prophet once before. Yeah. This is pretty close to it. Yeah. This is pretty close. So God is saying uh, the time is drawing now. If we were just, we were just simply taking it as word. So one step at a time. So how can we do this? How can we stay clean in the contaminated world? One step we can take is to starve the flesh of his appetites. Starve the flesh of its appetites. God says, uh, flee any appearance of evil. Any appearance of evil. Get away from it. God says, don't feed uh, that fleshly desire. Secondly, we can overcome it by crowding it out. What do you mean crowding it out? Uh, we have to get our mindset right. You know, uh, there's a passage, some of these passages in the Bible, they just make it plain. And we talked about this in Wednesday night Bible study. There's one verse that just make, makes it as plain, and this is my brother Quentin's anchor verse. That's Philippians 4. Finally, brother, what your mindset should be. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence in any of these things, where the praise dwell, think on those things. If your mind is clogged with the righteousness of God, you don't have time for this other foolishness. It can't get through. It can't get through. So that means we need to set our minds on this thing and focus on things above. That's how you crowd it out, is what God is saying here. Sin cannot gain a foothold in your heart if it's all covered up with God's word. Move to our last outline. Talking about how we need to set our mind on things above. There are just some things that need to be remembered as well. Don't forget what God has done for you. Don't forget what God has provided for you. And don't forget what God has planned for you. Verses 3 and 4 talk about that. Say, for you have once again died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So if your life is hidden in Christ in God, that means you need to be looking to be in his presence on a consistent basis. Verse 4 says, now when Christ, who is our life, should be our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. And not just in heaven, not just in the third heaven, but here on earth as well. Goes back to 1 Peter 3.15. And so, keep in mind what needs to be remembered in these last two verses here. They serve as reminders of some very important spiritual truths even today. 
we need to consider them before we leave these other things behind. There has been a death, it says here. Remember the death that took place. <laughs> we are reminded again that we have died to sin. It no longer has power over us. It no longer has, has, has to have influence over us. Then say it went away, but it doesn't have to have influence over us. One of the surest ways for the child of God to enjoy his spiritual victory in his or her life is for that person to understand that they are crucified with Christ. What happened to Christ on the cross happened to me. He paid for that sin. It's a done deal. It no longer has power. He's taken the sting out of death and also the power out of sin. That's what we need to be focused on. And so God says, be dead to sin and alive to Christ. Next, there has been a deposit. Not only been a death, there's also been a deposit. When we're saved, we were given this brand new thing, a life in Jesus Christ. That means there's some attributes that we can share and shine from the life that he lived. It, it's talking about the impartation of divine nature, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We decide how often we'll be filled with that same spirit. This new life guarantees the believer not only eternal security, not just duration of life, but also donation and quality of life. So your life is not about its duration, it's about your donation. Donation of service to the Lord, obedience to his will and his way. That's the deposit that's been placed inside of us, what God is saying. How is your soul today? Finally, there's a dream. There has been a dream that God has given us. You'd have to downgrade your dream because of your circumstances. You need to upgrade your faith to meet your destiny. And so we see here Paul closes this paragraph reminding us that this world is not the best there is. When you look at verse 4, this is not all there is. God has saved the best for last. We may have to deny our own flesh down here, but when we get to heaven, we have to worry about that. It's, it's, it's uninterrupted praise on a daily basis. But guess what? We can have joy and praise as we walk on this earth. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, y'all know how when, when Terry Anderson get happy, he just get loud, don't he? Don't he get loud? Yeah. Uh, that, that ought to be going on on the inside of your spirit, whether you're an extrovert or not. That ought to be some times when you just walk and think about how good God has been, and you just want to go back and let one out. I told y'all one time I'm going to scare all of y'all. I'm going to scare every last one of y'all. But you know I've been holding back. You know I'm holding back, bro. You know I've been holding back. All right, because God has been too good to you and to me. I don't know how a person can walk around and not be happy and excited about what God has done. Now, when we were younger, we didn't understand. When we said, come on, you don't take all that. You don't take all that. What you doing? Don't you see these other people quiet over here, sit down, tell them, listen. And the other person, they think they're about, but you don't know what God has done for me. You don't know what he brought me through. All I got to do is hear his name. <laughs> There's something about the, the, the name Jesus. It just does it. I'll come back. Let me go outside first. I'll be back there. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. You need to be getting to that point. You need to be getting to that point where you just you can't wait to tell somebody about Jesus. If, now, I live right now. I hear somebody speak his name. I, I try to get in the conversation. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I ease over there so I can get in. But I can't wait to talk about how good he is. This is what God is saying. God is saying, uh, don't you know what God has already done and what he's promised to do? So right now, every believer, we, we're battling with this world. We're battling with the flesh and the devil. But it won't always be that way. But in the meantime, God has provided for us. So as I conclude, right now, God is saying, I need you to take a look at what your mindset is. There are questions that, that need to be answered to keep heaven in our view. God needs to be at work in our lives. And before he can be at work in our lives, he needs to be at, at work in our minds. There are some things in life that we must retain, some things in our life we must release, and there are some things in our lives that we must remember. God says we need to take a trip down memory lane and nail down a few of these things. He said, maybe I need to remind you what I've already delivered you from, so I can show you where I'm taking you to. But it all begins with a mindset that is focused on him. Learn how to focus on things above. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for grace. We thank you for mercy. We thank you for peace. We thank you for reminding us of who we are in Christ Jesus. Thank you for reminding us of what you've already done. The things you dropped out of our lives and told us not to pick up again. We thank you for the release you're willing to give us, Father God. And a relaxed attitude we can have until we see you face to face. 
But there may be one here today that hasn't accepted your son as their personal savior. Let them know that right now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. If they're simply surrender, come unto Jesus just as you are. Believe in his person and his word. And right then, God will enter you into his kingdom. In the sweet and strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Amen. Church. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Come on. Yes. If there's one here today, I would like to accept.